Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. All right. Well, God bless you all. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Bill. Uh, God is good. And uh, all the things that we go through is for us to grow. And uh, what an awesome place to grow and people to grow with. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we get into this today, we're ending the chapter 21 of Matthew. And uh, we're going to be in uh, verse 33 to verse, (coughs) excuse me, 42 or 46, sorry, the end of this chapter. And uh, it's about the the parable of the tenants. and this this is serious. It means something. It's very precious to my heart to be able to teach this. And I and I've said in the past, every time that we do something for the Lord, we should do it as it's the very last time we're ever going to get to do that thing. It should be that important to us. Amen. Uh, so let me start off with uh, there was this guy who was renting an apartment and uh, he called the landlord and he told the landlord he said the the people above me every night they're stomping and yelling and shouting on the on the my ceiling their floor and uh, the landlord said yeah well I hadn't heard from anybody else uh, about that and he said, uh, is it bothering you? And he goes, not really. I play my trumpet until midnight anyway. Uh, a skewed vision. But sometimes when we are the tenants of things, we're so involved in our own self, we don't understand uh, what we're doing to other people around us. Amen? So I'm going to go ahead and read this out of uh, chapter 21, starting with Thursday. Verse uh, 33, uh, the years that Anna has been alive tomorrow. I just told that. All right, verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented it. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When harvest time approached, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect fruit. The tenants seized his servant. They beat one, they killed another, and they stoned a third. Then he sent servants, uh, other servants to them more than the first time. And the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those tenants he will bring them he will bring those wrenches to an end they will they re, uh, they replied and he will rent the vineyard to another tenant who will give them the share of the crop at harvest time Jesus said to them, Have you not read the Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. 
Anyone who it falls on will be crushed. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable. They knew that he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd and the people because they held him as a prophet. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this day that you have blessed us with, Lord. We thank you for this place that we meet and all the things that you give us. And especially we thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. So, does anybody understand that just from reading that? pretty much understand what this parable means. So I don't need to explain it anymore. We can dismiss and go out to the restaurants before them church people get there. (laughs) All for naught, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, So, in 33, this is uh, in verse 33, it says, listen to another parable. Uh, Jesus is always using parables, and 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 the the reason why he does is so it's a, it's a it's something that's going on in the time, something that they can understand, uh, and it also has a, a spiritual, a heavenly view in it, and uh, it's not offensive to people. If they don't understand it, it's not offensive. So he uses these to the people who are willing to understand or have the inkling of the Holy Spirit will understand what these things are. So if if we talk about these and you don't quite get it yet, that's okay. You're willing to learn and that's the beginning of a great walk with God. If you get it, and you can explain it better than me, then we need to talk because I need a break. Uh, Just kidding. So, it says, the landowner who planted the vineyard, and he put a wall around it, and he dug a wine press. Uh, In Scripture, God refers to that as a hedge. Uh, He states that the hedge that he put around the people of Israel was a law to keep them separated from the rest of the world because they had the law of God. They had the commandments. So, uh, this is your shield from the rest of the world. You're trying to do these things. They don't care about them. That's the separation and the the wall is kind of that thing around the around Israel. That's a picture of that. And it says that he dug a dug a, a, a wine press. In the in those days, a wine press would be out of uh, limestone, and they would actually find limestone and dig down in it, chip it out to where they had a a flat semi-flat or as flat as they could area uh, to create like a, a barrel effect like today we'll, you go to a winery they use barrels and you'll see pictures of people stomping grapes same type idea but then they'll have a little lip and one right below it so that the fluid will run out and and collect in the one beneath it and the grapes and the skin will stay up uh, and the meat of the grapes will stay up in the first one as it's crushed. So, that was something that they put together. The, the wall he put around it, this takes great care to have a vineyard, right? And it takes time to have a vineyard. Um, he says that he built a watchtower. Uh, a watchtower. A man with a A sling and some rocks from a watchtower can hit a lot of stuff. He can probably protect that whole property. 
He can at least see what's coming, what's going. Uh, we have a problem here in Texas with pigs, and man, they'll tear grapes up. They'll tear crops up. Uh, pecan trees, you, they just root. So this is one of the things for the fence, for the wall, to keep those types of things out that are going to uh, harm the fruit. Now, when you uh, when you think about it, this is a picture that we're drawing out of God's kingdom. Okay? You being the fruit. And God protecting you. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it says, listen, well, Maybe I didn't give her that one. Romans 11.25 I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles have come in. This is a mixing that Israel has been hardened partly, some of them, for a, for a reason, for the Gentiles to be able to mix in. That's part of Paul's ministry, way down. It's part of our ministry now. It's to all the nations, right? Did I lose anybody yet? Just me? All right. <clears throat> so, I put that up there first so that we can see that this is already happening until the time that the Gentiles are in to fulfill the the number that God is taking. So when we wonder sometimes why people don't get it, why uh, why did these guys keep not understanding but understanding but not repenting? Uh, there's a reason for all of that. Um, those of you who are studying with us on on uh, Wednesday night, uh, the study that we've been going on is that very same thing. God has, has given many opportunities and then He takes some serious and drastic things to get people's attention. And here He is pleading with these men who uh, question His authority. So, in this, we we see in in the very first of chapter twenty one, uh, Jesus is presented. In the second part, he cleans the temple. In the uh, the third part, you have the the cursing of the fig tree, and then the question of authority. These parables come after the questioning of his authority, so they're in line with that. The three before, and now in verse twenty-two, uh, chapter twenty-two, there's three that that come with it. The uh, parable of the wedding feast, or the wedding guests. The first parable was uh, the two sons, one disobedient and one not. Uh, this this one here is the parable of the tenants, which there is a tenant that is not obedient to the landowner and therefore kills the son. And the second one being the parable of the wedding banquet, or the third one. So as we go on, this is going to make a lot of sense, but we've got to keep re-going back to kind of understand it on a level of each day. If we were to go through and just take the time to go through the whole entire chapter, which would be awesome if we had a Sunday night service, we could probably do that. But uh, we don't do that right now. So as we're going through, we see that he has now rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And uh, I just want to point out a couple of scriptures here. One, Psalms uh, chapter 80, verse 7 and 9. <clears throat> Restore us, God Almighty. 
Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. You transported a vine from Egypt. Now on Wednesday nights, we, we've been seeing this. We're uh, in Numbers, Exodus, sorry, uh, chapter, well, 11 and 12 this week. So he's taken his vine out of Egypt. It's cool how these stories come together. And drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. And it took root and filled the land. It took root and filled the land. And that was his prophecy to Abraham that he was going to make, uh, there was going to be so many people, sands of the sea, there's so many grains of sand that he was going to accomplish. And he didn't see that promise, but we have. And uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. The people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness. But he heard a cry in the distance. A cry of distress. A cry of his people who were being oppressed. When uh, when we start to put this together, we see this picture of the kingdom being the vineyard. We see the, the wine press, which is the blood of Christ is re- referred to and we take sacraments and we use uh, grape juice for that. Then the tower, uh, the strong tower in Psalms uh, 61 verse 2 and 3. From the ends of the earth I will, I will call to you. I will call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foes. So what what do you guys think the tower would be used for? Storage, for protection like I talked about with the sling, whatever weapon it was to see what is coming, what's happening. Uh, That's God's refuge for us. So he's building these places inside this vineyard. Can you see where he's talking about his kingdom? And uh, in Isaiah, oh no, Proverbs 18. Put your glasses on. The name of the Lord is a uh, fortified tower and the righteous run into it and are saved. Is He your tower? Can you run to Him? How many times can you do that? As many times as you get out. You have to go out to work the vineyard, right? But you have a place of refuge in this vineyard where you can go. Uh, As we talked about the parable of the two sons, one said, no, I'm not going to go. The other one said, yeah, I will go and didn't. One said, I'm not going to go. And then he felt and he went and did. And he went to work. That's the main thing, to work in the vineyard. And this parable follows that up. Working in the vineyard, we can see how the vineyard's laid out. In uh, in verse, or in uh, the ending of verse 33, it says, the and uh then he rented it to some farmers and he moved to another place. He moved to another place. And we're going to come back to that, but that's that's very significant that he moved to another place. In uh, verse 43, it says, When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants 
to his tenants to collect fruit. He sent his servants to his tenants to collect fruit. Now, this, I'm going to tell you, speaks of God's love and kindness. And uh, that might be hard to grasp at first, but I'm going to try to help you see what this, what the, what I'm saying here. In uh, the tenants in 35, the tenants seized the servant because he sent more. Look, you guys are not doing what you're supposed to be doing. I sent my servants out there, beat them, killed one, stoned another. Send some more. More than the last. They do the same thing over again. They beat them. They stone them. They throw them out. But he sent more. See, this picture of, of God, he's allowing himself, not only himself, but the servants to suffer in rejection. That's where we get stuck. We want people to like us. I know I do. When somebody doesn't like me or says, you know, I you know, I don't like that guy, if I know about it, that weighs heavy on me, you know? Most of you are the same way, right? Some of us have thick skin where we can just say, whatever, I don't care what people think. To heck with them. I'm not that person. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I've got to develop a thicker skin. Uh, definitely know that. But I don't want it to be too thick because I still want him to be able to penetrate it. Amen? Rejection. Think about all the messengers that have come. All the messengers that came to Israel. And this is a picture of that. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, David, Jeremiah, Isaiah. That's just to mention a few. And, and, and what happened to them? Uh, I, Jeremiah, Zechariah was cut in half. Uh, Micah, when he uh, he was bashed in the face, and they all had horrible things happen to them. They were resisted. The more I find, the more that God loves, the more man resists, and it doesn't make sense. With our brothers and sisters, you see them start being blessed and things start to change and we start to go, I don't like them anymore. You know, when you're in the world and somebody gets out from underneath that and they start coming away from sin and coming apart, most of the time, you don't know how to, the people don't know how to react. I, I want my dad to be the way the old crappy dad that he was before, because I knew how to re I knew how to think about that guy. You know, I knew everything about that guy. I knew how he was going to react this way and this way. Now this new guy, who is this? I don't like that. Because we get to used to the old person, and that one's passed away. Amen. The new one has come. All right, so John chapter 15, 16 and 17. Uh -uh. You did not choose me. Did you guys know that? A lot of people say, I, I found Jesus. I found Jesus. Uh, we are so much about our own selves, we, we think we found him. <laughs> really this is true you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit and fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name in my father's name uh, my father will give you ask in my name my father will give you 
in uh, this is my command love each other and i would tell you guys if you were to go there and read the rest of that it's beautiful it should speak to your heart it should make you really when you read that uh chapter 15 of john it's just telling you how much He loves you. But His commandments. We had some things going on last week on the Facebook and stuff and some arguments and whatnot. If you read this, Jesus says, these are My commandments. My Father loves Me because I have kept His commandments. Now I will love you as my Father loved me if you keep mine. He gives two commandments. Love each other. Love your neighbors. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. That fulfills all the law. But people still want to have all the law when this is what Jesus said. He came to fulfill the law, correct, but He has now left His commandments. His name is higher than any other name. Okay, sorry, I got out there. Sorry. Um, in uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, <clears throat> I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My love, my loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it and cleared it of all the stones. He planted with it a choice vines. He built a watchtower in it. And he cut out a wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and the people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it. When I look for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? What more could I have been, what more could have been done for my vineyard than what I have done? What more can God do for you than what He's already done? You know, I'm just waiting for that one more thing, Lord, that one more, if you, uh, you know, I'm going to put that fleece out one more time, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait just a little bit longer. I need this much more money in my bank account before I do that, Lord. None of those things are going to help. He's done it all. He's done everything so that He should have good grapes, good fruit, good crop. And Jesus tells us later in Matthew that the workers are few, but the harvest is ripe. He's just looking for workers. What are you today? Are you a worker? Or you just want to live off of His fruits? We all want to be served, but... Uh, Jesus came to serve. Amen. So Luke chapter 20 verse 9. And this story is retold here. In, uh, or it's told again, but it's a little bit different. It says, He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to someone, to rent it to some farmers and went away for a long time. I want to just add this to you. How long have we been waiting for the Lord to come back? How messed up is His vineyard? 
how's it been how's it been handled yeah went away for a long time but the next verse after that went away for a long time <clears throat> but when harvest time approached he started sending out his servants sending out his servants sometimes we're going to be uh, disappointed sometimes we're going to be refuted sometimes we're going to be not received well we might even have people physically fight about us do we see that in the world today Amen, we do. Everywhere you see that. <clears throat> it's tough. When you refuse to repent, there is no forgiveness. What does God want? Forgiveness. So what do we have to do? Repent. Amen? That's what He's trying to do. He's giving these guys a chance. He's trying to tell them in all kinds of ways so that they'll get it. Right? One of them probably had a vineyard, you know, and people working it. Probably went through this kind of thing. Got to get rid of those people and put these people in there. So now we're going to go to verse 37. Oh, no, I'm a, uh, yeah. He sent some more, turns out, yeah, more than the first time. 37. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Um, last of all, he sent my son. In this is in this story, Jesus is telling this right. So, who was the last word of God? I'm going to make a whole bunch of people more mad. If Jesus was the last word. John was the last prophet sent from God before Jesus, correct? What about all these other ones? Hmm? What about the ones that came after Jesus saying, I got this other message. I got a new message for the new church, for the new people. If Jesus is the last thing that this, this guy is doing before He comes and takes the people out, turns the place upside down and gets rid of them and puts people in that are going to give good fruit and give him from some of the crop. Then how many more how much more time do we have? How many more men are going to come? No more. It should narrow down the books where we we read. It should not narrow down the things we believe, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't. People go, no, you have to add this to it and that to it. And it makes it more jumbled and it makes it more hard in your head, in your mind, to try to figure things out. There's a lot of people who uh, believe in universalism. And... Uh, I didn't spell it correctly when I wrote it down. That's how much I don't believe in it. Uh, it can't be possible. If, if there's so many people out there that believe that we don't have to come to Jesus to go to heaven. We don't have to come to Jesus to go to be able to speak with God. Um, that's, that is refusing to repent. That is refuting God's word. And it's wrong. It can't work. Right? I've got another way to go to heaven. There's many ways you can go to heaven. Heck yeah, there's many ways you can go to heaven, but there's only one way you're going to stay. Amen? The only one way is to go through Jesus Christ. I pause for a dramatic effect. <clears throat> So 
So here we, we, we see in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can you see why these, they're still sinners? He's sending more people more people to give them the opportunity to do what's right, right? And this, it's just giving some of the grapes. Uh, for us, it's to give, to change our fruit, to repent. Since we now have been justified through His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Now, look at that. We've been justified through His blood. And we use the blood of a grape to symbolize that. He's using the fruit of a grape to symbolize this wine press. What more do we need than His blood? For if while we were God's enemies... Were you, did you ever think you were God's enemy? Every one of us were before we believed. We were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? How much love is that? How much grace is that? How much more can He do for this vineyard? He's done everything. What do we have to do? We have to believe. Amen? And if we go to 40, verse 40, our... 38, when the tenants saw his saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Now, in those days, if you found a piece of land that the heir died, you could go and take that. And that would be yours now. You could claim it uh, when, when somebody, if there was nobody to pass it to. Um, this being the son, they're thinking we're going to kill him and then then this whole thing will be ours, right? We're gaining it for ourselves. Now we've got the wall, we've got the grapes, we've got the tower. We are in the place, they're putting themselves in the place of God. They're building their own kingdom. How many of us have built our own kingdoms? And how many times have you had it tore down? Yeah. To rebuild it a different way. Well, maybe this is what God wants me to do. To have it torn down, to rebuild it. No, okay. It's a repetitive thing. We can get stuck there. When, when they see the son, they're going to kill the son and take his inheritance. How terrible is that? In verse 39 of 21, it says, So they took and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. How many of you realize that we, as we've been doing this, we've been reading through Matthew and studying Matthew, that they took him out of the city to kill him? Uh, Passover different things, reasons why he was taken out. They take this son out. I mean, that, that's a parallel to it, right? I mean, you, you got to be able to see it. They take this son out to kill him. And Jesus in verse 40, he says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? 
right there. When the owner of the vineyard comes, what does that say to you? Victory, right? That is victory. Victory in Jesus. When he comes back, when the owner of the victory of the of the vineyard comes back, what will he do to those tenants? It's incredible. What will he do? John was the final word. Now Israel in the in the Old Testament, in the old it speaks of Israel as being the vineyard. Uh, and they had in the temples, they had the pictures of the vineyard. Uh, some of their coinage had a picture of a vineyard on it. And uh, so that, that was uh, uh, representative of Israel uh, being fruitful and bearing fruit as a nation. That was the intent, always the intent of God. Uh, In Acts chapter 4, verse 10 and 12, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. That this man stands before you is healed. And this is uh, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. In in Acts, when when Peter is preaching this, he's telling them what they already know from Scripture. He's not telling them anything they don't know, but he's telling them at this point that Jesus was that stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found. In no one else, there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which he must be saved. No other name. No other name. The name of Jesus. The ministry of him is the way we are saved. If you don't know him today, I'm telling you, you need to. You sure need to. The stone that the builders rejected. In 41 of 20 of 21, Matthew 21, what Jesus, what they say to Jesus now is is it's they are prophesying their own what's going to happen to them. It says he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, he replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. How many times in in life have we stated something and it happened? When those guys spoke, when they spoke, I mean, when they were hearing this story, can you imagine? They were angry. Ah, he's going to come back and he's going to tear those guys up and he's going to toss them out and put somebody else in there. And a lot of times we speak out of anger, right? We get, you know, oh, we hear about something. We're like, yeah, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And uh, when when I'm in front of that person, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that. And the Holy Spirit comes in and changes all that, right? You know, you're getting ready to, you're getting crossed sideways and then all, and then before you know it, you're hugging like, what happened? He happened. The Holy Spirit entered in and fixed it. Amen. They answered in anger. And by their own words, 
it will be done to them. That's amazing. As we as we were reading in uh, Numbers verse nine, chapter nine, it says that uh, uh, when he's talking about one of the plagues, Pharaoh says, "Tomorrow, Exodus." Yeah, Numbers. There's too many studies. Um, tomorrow, take that plague away. And then it starts tomorrow. Tomorrow, and and uh, by his word, he always. Starts tomorrow, ends tomorrow. And it's neat the way that word plays out. But he's the one that started it. It wasn't God. He said tomorrow. <clears throat> so you got to wait one more day. But you got one more day to repent. Amen? Because he loves us so much. So then Jesus tells them, Have you never read in Scripture. And that already makes them mad, right? You're the guys that's supposed to be teaching this stuff, right? The stone the builders rejected has come to be the cornerstone, for the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Marvelous in our eyes. The stone that the builders rejected you know, uh, some of you have dealt with different types of bricks and foundations and whatnot, but if that stone is just not perfect to set the rest of it, uh, it'll be off, it, will go, it won't be uh, centered, it, it can throw the everything off if it's just not the perfect stone. And Jesus was that perfect stone. We make up the rest of that wall. And there's not one of us that's perfect. So that first one has to be, right? Has to be perfect. In uh, verse 33 or 43, it says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. Uh, God's intent the whole time was for Israel to do what they were supposed to do to be God's chosen people. Uh, Some of them were. Some of them are today. But the Gentiles came in and and that was chosen too for the Gentiles to come in. Um, If you remember, can they come in this church? Those guys aren't circumcised. They must be circumcised before they can do this. Uh, they, they, were, they were putting things back on and Peter was like, oh yeah, you know what? That is something we believe. That's what we need to do. But it wasn't. And that's where they had a problem because the circumcised, circumcising now is of the heart and not of that other thing. <clears throat> but we still... Throw up walls, our own walls, why we can't believe it. So first Peter chapter two, verse six through ten. For the scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Man, that is beautiful. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. That's a precious stone. Do you guys believe that? But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become a cornerstone has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which also they were destined, destined for. 
but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you remember when Jesus came to the Pharisees and said, have you not read that I love mercy over sacrifice? We have received that mercy. That stone was given for us. <clears throat> and those who fall on it, in 44 it says, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken. And anyone whom it falls will be crushed. There's a difference there. To fall on your knees before the stone means that you're submitting, that you're giving your all to that, that you need that. But if it falls on you, you're crushed into dust. One is something you can do at any time in your life. I tell you to do it now. Don't wait till later. Because later when it falls on you, that says over. Crushed to dust, right? Okay, so... That picture of falling and being crushed leads them to understand this in 45. It says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew He was talking about them. They looked for a way to kill, arrest Him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held Him as a prophet. The people held him as a prophet. So these guys, look, this is this is this hurts people's feelings. And that's sad. These Pharisees and teachers of the law were afraid of people. They were afraid of people when they talked about, when he asked them about the question of John. They wanted to take him out and, and kill him. But they didn't want to say that John, you know, we, don't, we think it was a human thing that John came and it wasn't from God because the people feared him as a prophet so they'll, they'll come after us, right? Now again, They're fearing that the people are going to come after them if they say what they want to say because they see Jesus as a prophet. They fear man, but they don't fear God. You have to think about that in the, in the terms of this world today. If, I, if we fear what everybody else thinks, what everybody else can do to us, what they can come up with to put in front of us to make us stumble a scheme to come against us and who are we fearing we're not fearing God anymore right he fights the battles he's the one who's in control of those things he works all those things to for what good to those who love him these guys don't have any idea about that they fear the people. They don't fear God. Man. I admit, there's some things I fear in people. You know, governments, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Well, they start talking about we only got 24 days worth of diesel reserve and then 
No more diesel for the United States. What? You know, I'm going to fill my truck up. What's that going to do? <laughs> if we're out, we're out. I can drive my truck till like somewhere it's going to be <laughs> stuck on the side of the road. Thank God I still got a gas vehicle, right? <clears throat> yeah. Until we can't use them anymore. What would Jesus do? Would he go spend all the money he's got and buy diesel and stock up on it? Probably not. Probably not. If you're the one who could take your soul, not the one that could take your life. So, the chief priests, the Pharisees, in this parable are the bad tenants. They're the bad land, bad, bad tenants taking the landowner's uh, property and doing away with it or what they want. God's the landowner. The kingdom is the vineyard. The servants are the prophets who have come. The son is Jesus. And God has done everything Already, he's done all the work and set everything up so that he should have good fruit. Amen? He should have good fruit and nothing else. But he's been rejected. And still he sends more. Uh, Spurgeon's, I, I, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, wrote something that I'm gonna quote. He wrote, uh, well, I'm not gonna quote it verbatim, but the main theme of this Bible is God's love for people. So the subtext of this Bible is the human resistance of God. <clears throat> with Jesus, if you reject Him, He answers with tears. If you wound Him, He bleeds cleansing. If you kill Him, He dies to redeem you. And if you bury Him, He rises in the resurrection. All of that is done for us. And sometimes we don't understand what actual true love is. It's not always just patting somebody on the back or giving them a hug or giving them whatever they want so they won't throw a fit. Sometimes it's tough. I don't know what kind of love you need today. But the Lord's here. I don't want for any of us to have to have tough love. But if that's what we need, that's what we need. So John being the last prophet that was sent and Jesus being the final word from the beginning to the end. What more can he do? Do we need to have more books written so that we understand? Do we need more people to write their books? Man, I asked, you turn the news on and, and it's interviewing somebody who's selling a book. Yeah. Everybody in here could write a book. Right? You don't think so? Everybody could write a book. None of you would be able to read mine unless you could spell the way it sounds. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Greg's shorthand books? They're old. I got all of them. I love looking at it. Like that guy was the Greg. 
don't understand it, but I can read it. Uh, anyways, God knows you. He knows your heart. He built you. And uh, He can speak to you just the way you need to hear it. But here's sometimes we need to have a hearing test. Sometimes we need to get our ears cleaned out. Sometimes you might need to get a hearing aid. Sometimes we just need to open our eyes because that's when our ears work best. These men here are just refusing and rejecting God because they want their own thing. And I, I'm telling you today that that is not a way to live. That is not a way to build anything. It's not a way to build a church. It's not a way to build your life. It's not a way to build a marriage. He's the way. Everything around Him. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to close out today. If there's anyone that needs prayer for anything, and excuse me, there's communion up here. Uh, if anybody wants to take communion, we've got that set out. We all have things we're dealing with. In uh, marriage counseling some years ago, uh, was shown to me something that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes I don't remember it, but in a marriage you have, say, 80% good and 20% bad. But it's what you're focusing on if your marriage is good or bad. If you focus on all the bad things, 20% is going to be huge to you. But if you focus on the good things, the good things are going to be what covers everything up. Right? Amen? So I'm telling you today, be positive, stay positive, pray positive. For God is positive. And I am positive of that. All right, as we close out, if anybody needs anything or needs any prayers, come on up. Don't be afraid. Uh, Wednesday is back here at the church. Amen. Uh, we've had a, a lot of people giving and helping out, and uh, we've taken a month and cut down the bills around here and, and stopped some services and discontinued some things and tightened the belt. Uh, it's that way in a lot of everyone's homes. Uh, there's pastors that I talk to all the time, and they're everybody's feeling it what's going on now in the world. And uh, so when we look to things, we need to look to Him. When we pray, we need to pray positive. All right? And uh, thank you all on Facebook for uh, blessing us. Uh, we've got some, we've had some blessings come in from Facebook people out there on the internet and whatnot. That's, it's amazing to know that uh, that happens. I want to do, I just stop doing that. Everybody else has stopped doing that. But every time I even think about that or say that, uh, somebody will write and say, don't, don't, this helps. So join with me in prayer. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank You for the life that You put in us. Lord, I don't ask that You take any pains from me personally. But I ask that You would give me a longing for Your, for your Word. I would ask You that You would make these people in this church have someone in front of them that you could, they could share You Share your testimony. Show each one of us, Lord, how easy it is to love 
and how easy it is to receive love from You, Lord. Thank You, Father, for being the one that's always there and always listening. Lord, teach us as we sleep. Give us a burning desire for more of Your Word. More of Your Word. Let the world away. And, and focus on You. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call. 682-327-7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?